they've done. Every time they add another step or another article to the calculation question, that's just more time, right? So it's the same thing on the master's test. Some of those questions, even for me, knowing them as well as I do and knowing the code as well as I do, it can still take six or seven minutes to work your way through all the steps. So what that means is that you really have to be on top of your game with what? Code questions, right? You've got to be able to find them and locate them pretty quickly, move through the book, and watch out for the trap door. So we'll cover all that today and kind of give you some heads up on what to avoid and kind of how to navigate it. This is exactly what uh, the examination bulletin that they give you online says. And that is a breakdown on the uh, master's test earlier. This is the journeyman electrician. We'll start with this one more so than anything else since I've got a larger uh, collection of journeymen. But this uh, breakdown, how many of you guys in here have tried to take the test already at least once? So uh, about half, right? Okay. So you all have seen this before, and you know in each category how you did or how you didn't do, right? So for those that haven't taken it, when you're done at the end of the time frame, before you get up from that computer, it's going to give you your results right then and there. And it's kind of disheartening sometimes to... Uh, I actually it, have my sheet with you? me. Good. Yeah. If you have your sheet with you, uh, sometime during one of the breaks, I'll sit down with you and tell you kind of where... Because uh, it's kind of tough. If you just look at this, yeah, I know that I'm going to have six questions that are in calculations, uh, theory, plans, and definitions, right? Now, I, most of you guys in here know that, that definitions are going to be in Article 100, so that's no brain. Uh, theory, that's a tough one to kind of categorize, especially in an open book, NEC book, because there's really not much theory in it, right? So it's just the calculations. And when they say calculations on that top line, they're talking about non-code calculations, such <coughs> as uh, Ohm's Law calculations, right? And then the plans, everybody in here is going to have a blueprint plans, and fortunately for you all, we have a pretty good uh, 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 a facsimile of the prints that you guys will be able to take a look at. And it looks almost exactly like the set they have, almost, but not quite. And then the second line, which is electrical services, service equipment, and separately drive systems, that line item right there is probably the weakest area that we, ever, that we see across the board. And uh, of course, the PSI has been given these examinations since uh, what was it, late uh, 2009, I guess. Uh, 2009 or 2008? 2009. 2009, when I yeah. took in 09, that's when I took mine. Was it? And it just started yeah, it over to the PSI. So it's been a few years here, and this line item's pretty much been the same uh, since they've had it. Okay? What's tough about that line item is we're, if you do that poorly in that line area, or that line item, where do you go to study those particular sections in your code book? I mean, what articles are those? What chapters? And that's the tough part about this breakdown is, yeah, they tell you kind of what your test is going to be about, but you've got 870 pages there to figure out exactly where all of those fall into. So just real quickly, let's look at it. Electrical services, service equipment, and separately derived systems. That is uh, primarily found where? Article 250. Don't cheat. Hey, you told me For those that haven't gone through the, the, the class help. before, go to the back of the class. <laughs> uh, where would you find a where would you find a test question that had to do with electrical services? Two thirty. Two thirty, right? Who said that? You did. Both of you. All right. So Article two thirty, right? Service equipment. Uh, some of it in two twenty five. Some of it two thirty. Most of it in two thirty, and then a little bit uh, occasionally you'll find it spread throughout chapter four, but mostly in in two thirty. And then separately derived systems will be found where? Huh? Is that transform? uh, transformers can be, but usually what they're talking about with a separately derived system is going to be some other power generates, uh, like a, a generator or some fuel cell or some other uh, power production uh, plant. Yeah, you can find a few. The majority of what those questions right there, guys, are, all are going to be grounded and bonding of separately derived systems because that's really where we have a lot of differences in utility production or other types of production. So the majority of this is going to be found in Article 250 and specifically kind of in the 250.30 area. So if you do poorly in that line item, uh, you would want to go back and study 230, a little bit of 225, and then 250.30 through 250. And then it's 250.50. It's actually 50 is not included, but it goes all the way up to 250. 
top 50. So, the bottom line is that if you look at your handouts real quick, that folder that she handed uh, out when you uh, walked in the room, I don't know if I've got another one over here that I can kind of follow along. The very first sheet you might see on the uh, uh, left hand side should be one that says seminar outline or seminar breakdown, something of that nature. So, uh, similar out, seminar outline and breakdown with notes and ideas of areas of content by section. Okay, so if you have a, a, a test result just like that, what you can do is take this sheet right here, and I've gone through every, every one of those line items and given you at least a basic set of articles that match up with each one of these line items. Okay, so this is a phenomenal study sheet. All right, all you have to do is go through and say, like the very first line item here, the SAT1, that kind of corresponds with this line item. SA2 kind of corresponds with where we were just at, so let's look at that. Articles 230, 225, 220, 310, 15B, 310, 16, which is actually a misnumber. That's a 310, 15B, 16 is what that's supposed to read. Articles 240, some of uh, 49, uh, 490, possibly parts of Chapter 3, such as 314. And then your separately derived system rules are spread throughout the code book. Some in 250, transform rules in 450, which you mentioned and generated rules in 445, and then some special uh, SDS rules in Chapter 7 as well. So there you have it, right? It's a great tool to use if you don't pass the test, or if you've previously taken it and you know what your test results are, it kind of can kind of uh, narrow you down and focus, uh, focus you into where you need to concentrate on with your studies. So as we go through this class, you take your notes, right? The one thing I, I don't want to see or don't want to hear about or, or uh, uh, think about is that you'll take all these notes, you'll put them in a nice neat folder, and you'll put them on the uh, dashboard of your truck and forget all about them, right? You're going to have to break these out, and you're going to have to have a little bit of discipline with your study stuff. You're going to have to, okay? Guys ask me all the time, you know, when's the best time to take the test after the class? And the answer used to be about five days, right? About five days to kind of go over some of the handouts, about five days to kind of read uh, a few sections of the code book, which are must-reads, and I'll give you that list a little later. And then uh, a little bit of practice, uh, you know, maybe about an hour a day, right? And then after that, the longest you wanted to wait was about 14 to, to 21. Basically, three weeks is really kind of stretching. You go much beyond that, you're going to kind of forget some of the things we covered in class. And I mean, you know, it, shoot, I forget them, you know, Sundays I'm driving home. I don't remember what I told you guys. And you guys are going to be rough. All right. Uh, so when is the best time? It's going to be about 10 days. Now, if you're already scheduled, if you're already scheduled, don't worry about, you know, I wouldn't try to cancel or anything. I mean, it's, it's not going to hurt you to go in there and see the test, you know, again, other than 78 bucks, that, you know, you're out of pocket if you don't uh, pass it. But uh, it might actually in some ways be good if you can afford the $78 because you're going to have this class and then you're going to have the actual content right behind it. And some of the things that we talked about are going to click. And then when you go home and start studying, it's going to make a lot more sense. So if you're already scheduled, I wouldn't, I wouldn't unschedule unless it's just a dollar uh, deal for you. If it's a dollar deal for you, uh, we'll see what we can do to help. But the uh, uh, 10 days is going to give you just about enough time to go through your calculation stuff, your code areas that you're going to have to read, and then also you're going to have about a day or so that you're going to need to devote to working on some stuff in your book. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But there's some things that you have to do to your code book to really make it a useful tool. And uh, the only way to do it is to just physically go in there and make your marks and write your stuff down. And it, it just takes a little bit of time. An hour or two, you'd be pretty good. But you're going to have to devote that to it. So uh, <clears throat> the other thing that uh, is right on the right-hand side, excuse me, the left-hand side, right below that, is basically the same thing I'm showing you here, and that's your breakdown. Okay, so these two sheets kind of tie together. That gives you your breakdown from the PSI, and then there's you kind of a, a relative uh, sec or relative line item uh, list of what you can find in each category. But if you go back and look at this and kind of uh, look at the review here, you have your uh, definition, calculation, theories, and plans, uh, chapter one, article 100 for the uh, definitions. Now also, uh, definition questions. Let's say you had four definition questions on a test. Okay one might be at an Article 100. The other three are going to be totally in different spots, and that's usually where? Where do you find definitions other than Article 100? You 
find them in the front of every article that has multiple uh, defined terms, right? It's always going to be like the very first part, the section dot one is always going to be just basically a brief description of what's covered. The dot two will always be definitions. So if you look at 250.2 real quick in your code book, I don't even know what page number it is off the top of my head. 250.2, if you have a question that has to do with a uh, uh, definition term on grounding and bonding, I almost guarantee it's not going to be in Article 100. I wouldn't even start with Article 100. I'd start with 250.2. What page number is that? Uh, page uh, 70 and 71. 100. Oh, excuse me, 100? Oh, 70 is the uh, addition, right? Uh, it's page 100 and 101. Actually, 10. So if I had a test question that had to do with definitions of ground air bond, and like I said, I'd be in 250.2, uh, 9 and 100. So that's, that's your first tip, and whether it's worth more than a minute or two, I, who knows, we'll see. Uh, the second line item here we already talked about, that's the first part of Chapter 2, right? 230, 225 for the most part, uh, also 250. What about chapter or this uh, third line item here? Where would we find electrical feeders? It's in it's in it's in two, chapter two. Two ten. Uh, not two ten. Two ten is uh, two twenty five. is outside branch circuit computers. Two fifteen. <coughs> right. So again, that's kind of early on in chapter two. Now look at this uh, bad boy here, branch circuit calculation and conductors. That's going to be just to, to help you out. Most of that's going to be two ten. 220, and then a little bit in 310, which is your conductor, your ampacity, and different stuff like that. So again, a little bit of chapter one, a little bit of chapter two, kind of moving from chapter two to chapter three. Have you noticed in a pattern here? We're moving through the code book, aren't we? That's exactly what this line, this breakdown does. Next, we're wiring methods and materials. Guys, look at that. So you're taking a journeyman test, right? 18 questions, which is out of 80 is 25% of your test darn near, right? 23.6 if you really want to be uh, technically, mathematically correct. Uh, I'm kidding, I don't really know what it is. I just thought I was trying to impress you with a bullshit number make you think I was good at math. All right, so uh, that, wherever that is in that code book, right, whatever that section is, that's a pretty damn important section for you guys if you're taking a German test, huh? What'd you make out on that line item? How many did you get out of that, that line item? 11. 11 out of 18. Not bad, but there's seven points there. What did you uh, score? 52. So you, uh, with that was seven, seven points, points, you might have had, uh, what about? I've been a lot closer. Nine, ten, so you've been in the, in the 60s with yeah, it? Yeah, I've been okay. a lot closer. I'm going to tell you right now that this is usually a weak area for journeymen, but fortunately for you guys, it is the easiest line out of every one of these to repair or get up to speed on, okay? And we're going to cover it in pretty good detail here in a minute, but I want you to pay close attention because that is a really important line out in there. And then electrical equipment and devices, that kind of moves further into Chapter 4. Okay, we get into Chapter 4, we're talking about general use equipment. Motors and generators, again, Chapter 4, we're dealing with, uh, um, excuse me, we're dealing with uh, electrical, uh, motors and generators, of course, in the back part of Chapter 4, 430, 445, and electrical control devices and disconnecting means. That's going to be the next one. And again, we're still kind of in Chapter 4 with that. Uh, we find them in a few other places as well. But the special occupancies, equipment, and conditions, almost all of that's in what chapters? And I, I said it plural because there's more than one chapter. Special occupancies is where? Five. That's right. That's what, all of what Chapter 5 is, isn't it? It's basically special, uh, special occupancies or special types of uh, dwellings and that type of thing. And then special equipment. Chapter what? Six, right? And then special conditions, chapter seven. So you have five, six, and seven right in a neat row. And of course, renewable energy technology is a brand new line item that they just added for the 2011 edition. And those aren't uh, very difficult questions, but almost every one of those back, all the ones that we're aware of all come out of the back part of chapter six. Okay, those are going to be electrified truck parking spaces, uh, solar PV, your article 690 and you know that type of thing and again like i said most of those are fairly easy to find there's not a whole lot they can do to kind of disguise those questions are pretty much the same uh, throughout you have the next sheet uh, below on your uh, uh, handouts is basically a psi testing center regulations 
It also has the locations. Uh, you guys have several locations. And uh, y'all probably know better than I do. Is, is, are one or two of them pretty bad and the other ones aren't too bad? Isn't there one of them that's really, really terrible and the other three are okay? Or is it? Those of you who've gone through it, which one have you gone to? Anybody been to the Northwest Freeway one? That's the one I go to. I've been there twice. It's pretty, it's pretty in and out. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't mess with you too much. You can go to my book. Okay. That's good to hear. Uh, a couple times and East, about East Freeway? Anybody? Uh, and then North Sam Houston Parkway? Yeah, it's not yeah. that bad. Not that bad. And then... Uh, Chair number three is pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Chair <laughs> number three? <laughs> there, there's two in Austin. The reason why I'm asking is there's two of them in Austin, and one of them, uh, they couldn't care less. They, it's almost like they don't even know what you're, what you're in there for. Uh, they will kind of flip through your book, but that's about it. Um, but there's, a, there's another one in Austin that uh, she'll make you tear pages out and black stuff out and highlight and staple, you know, like if you use the little 3M tabs or whatever. Uh, if you want to keep them in there, you have to staple them to the actual page. I mean, there's some, there's some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, crazy. And that was kind of what my comment was uh, to, to the board, was that there's some rules out there that are real, real vague. And that is about the amount of notes that you can put in your book. And of course, the education guy, his comment was, well, you know, if, that's the, if that was the case, we'd be getting a lot of complaints. So what it is is the guys don't want to come in and show us what's in their book. That's a load of crap. What it is is you got people that don't work for the state. They work for a third party, and some of them get power trips, and some of them don't care. Some of them do the job pretty well, and some of them uh, can be pretty rough. All right, and then uh, moving on, talking about what they allow you to have and what they don't allow you to have. Uh, you can you can highlight, you can have indexes. Uh, for those of you that have our uh, tabs, the way we have these laid out is across the top, we have all of the important table tabs, okay? If you're taking your master's test and you don't have our tabs, bomb. Worth every penny you put into them. Taking the journeyman's test, it's really your call. I mean, they can be helpful. Uh, if, if it buys you three or six minutes, three or six minutes you didn't have before, uh, you guys can kind of make your uh, your own call on that. But for you guys, you just need it flat out. I mean, and they're all the tables that's specifically on that test, and well, for the journeyman test as well, but they're the ones that, that you know, like with motors, for example, you could be flipping from front and back article 430 way too much, uh, you know, and it just it slows you down if you don't have a tab across the top. And I like them across the top better than having them in here because they stand out and they're easy to, to know exactly what to deal with. If you don't have our tab and want to do your own, that's perfectly okay. Just make sure that they're uh, permanently affixed to the book. So just no 3M uh, uh, sticky notes or anything like that. And they do sell tabs. They're not quite like that, but they sell some tabs at Office Depot. They kind of fold over and then you can make your own notes. And uh, if you have our tabs, I think she's got a few extra ones too. So if you run across a couple of tables that you want to add your own tabs to, ask her and she'll give you a couple of blank ones so you can write some notes and kind of keep them uh, in play. And as far as the brief descriptive notes go, you heard what he said, so that is basically the rule. What the intent is is that you can write in your book. They just don't want you to have a whole page of uh, keyword cheat sheets in the very back in the blank pages like we used to do all the time. In fact, we used to have... Uh, uh, sticky uh, deals that you just slap in the back of your book and it had every uh, keyword that was on the test all with the page number and everything else and it was a sweet sweet deal back in the day but uh, uh, they kind of kind of got away from that and then they got away from uh, spiral bound notebooks as well we used to tell guys to uh, you know go down to office depot and for five bucks they'd spiral bound your uh, book and of course you know pages accidentally slipped in there you know during before the spiraling process began uh, you can put all kinds of neat things in there. And so they got rid of those. Of course, you can't bring a, you can't bring a five ring binder in it as well. So if in doubt on the handwriting stuff, what you want to do is limit it to about a, a single sentence per article that you write about, okay? And if you're going to do steps for your calculations, like when, you're, when we go through the uh, services or opacities or things like that, just write the steps next to the uh, article that they go to so that they're kind of spread throughout and not all on one page, okay? And then the other thing, the final note that I'll tell you about that, if you're gonna write notes on your book, try to write them toward the inside column if you can, because the closer they are to the spine of the book, the, the less obvious they are, you know, when you flip through. 
Not that I'm telling you anything that you're doing is, is uh, cheating or wrong, but you know, if you don't want to have the headache, why, you know, if you can avoid the headache, why even bring it up, right? So that is basically about it. And uh, just make sure you don't write anything in your uh, book in a pencil or blue ink. Uh, most of the testing centers will give you their blue map color or they'll give you a pencil or some sort like that. And so you don't want to have anything written in your book that they might accidentally mistake as something that you wrote down uh, during the examination because they will uh, basically put your test results on hold and they'll confiscate your book and it'll just be kind of a, kind of a headache. So it, it's really not worth the, uh, the risk. Now, when you get in there, if you're not comfortable with computers or whatever, this is not going to be an issue because it's real easy to navigate the uh, uh, system. But this is exactly the screen that you're going to be seeing when you go through the test. And this is actually really important because there's a couple of tabs up there uh, at the top that are incredibly important, and that's this mark button right there and the go-to button right there, okay? What we have here is that you'll have your test question across the top, and then you'll have the four answers to pick from across down the bottom. And they'll give you, basically, you just put your uh, mouse on there, click on it, and the two uh, uh, tabs on the bottom kind of go through the back and uh, will navigate you through all of the test questions. Those two items at the top, though, are really, really important, and they're really kind of the key to probably anywhere from five to ten uh, uh, points on your test results really are. So we'll come back and talk to you about it in just a minute. I just want to tease you just to uh, get you excited. All right. So right there, guys, is a breakdown of exactly where the test questions are coming from. I see, see a mad scrambling of, of note-taking. Almost so loud that I think the uh, uh, building air conditioner was, was uh, breaking down. You, if you look in your handouts, I did give you kind of a little breakdown. You have a little mini slide of the same thing. But what I would do is <clears throat> I'd take a moment to write down a couple of real key uh, areas. Just going across the board, you can look at the number of questions that come out of each section, okay? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that much, even though uh, Chapter 2 here has 163 questions. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have a ratio that's that much higher, a 1.6 to 1 in chapter 3. It just means that there are more questions in chapter 2 that you have to know that they have to pick from to populate your test. That's all it means. But you can tell, just looking at the, the uh, numbers here, that chapter 4 is pretty darn important. Chapter 3 is really darn important. And chapter 2, of course, is really important. Earlier, I said chapter 3 was 25% of the tournament test, right? So you know that chapter three is going to be one of the more important chapters for you to focus on, but chapter two comes right dead uh, smack behind it. So chapter three and chapter two really are the critical uh, deal makers on this test. They really, really are. Then, if you look at the breakdown out of the chapters, right here and right here you see three huge sections out of chapter two, 210 being the biggest, uh, yeah, by uh, a couple of points. 220 being the third biggest, and of course 250 being the second largest. And I would probably guess that 250 is actually the single largest because you also have some grounded bonding questions, especially on the master's test, that not only have to do with 250, but they also have to do with other sections in the code book, like swimming pool bonding and some other uh, solar PV. Uh, even for the journeyman's test, you'll have some bonding questions that have to do with uh, uh, agricultural building, uh, where livestock are present. I mean, there's a whole bunch of oddball questions out there that have some reference to ground and bonding, even though they're not directly uh, targeted at 250. And then out of Chapter 3, you look at that breakdown. Of course, this is all the back part of Chapter 3, which is all your wiring types and your raceways. Okay? So we have 43 throughout the back of that. That's probably closer to about 50. There's probably about 7 or so that we don't know. And then the other real big one here which is almost as big as 220, is as big as 220, is Article 300. And Article 300, even though there's uh, 28 listed there, that's even kind of a misleading number because Article 300 is the underlying kind of bedrock of electrical installation principles. So even though you might not directly have this as a, a specific article that answers the question, you may have a component out of 300 that will make your other article go one way or the other depending on whether or not you remember what's in Article 300 that controls the install. Does that make sense? You want an example of that? Uh, let's say that you had a, uh, let's say you had an underground installation. 
very below a street uh, street. But the raceway rigid conduit, an inch and a half. You're using threaded and sealed fittings. All your coupling connectors. Which of the following two insulation types would you be permitted to install? So, let me give you a choice here. And it's either going to be A or B or both A and B or neither one of the two. The first one's going to be uh, THHN. Y'all have all probably used that at one point in your career. The next one's going to be XHHW. So your answer is either A, B, both A and B, or neither A or B. What would your answer be? What would you pick? A. A? THHN? What would you pick? Now remember what I'm trying to show you here is an example of why sometimes Article 300 is an underlying principle. Really, where would you find the rule on conductors, specifically the insulation that allows, that's uh, permitted for particular installation? Article 310 deals with conductors, right? So 310 is, is basically the ruling article that tells you whether or not you can put THHN or XHHW in a particular area. It's actually 310.10 B and C. It used to be 310.8 in 2008, but it's the exact same section that just renumbered. So if you look in 310.10 B and C. Now I told you we were below, we're 18 inches below a street, so. So everybody, uh, if you look on 310.10 B and C, 310.10 B actually kind of starts on the very bottom of the uh, page in front of it, but then in the back part of the more relevant part. Huh? C2, yeah. Both of them? It's listed right there for uh, C, excuse me, B and C. They're both listed, right? Okay. Now, the answer to that test question is actually only B. THHN would not be a permitted conductor for that installation. Now, go back to 300.5 real quick. 300.5, and I think it's 300.5B if I'm not mistaken. Three hundred dot five B tells you what? Any raceway, doesn't matter how sealed it is, any raceway buried below a, a grade has to be classified as a wet location. Has to be, and it makes sense because no matter how you seal it, oh sorry, no matter how you seal it, you're still going to have condensation occur because of the different temperatures between the interior of the raceway and the outside, right? So the condensate's going to collect in. It's going to be a wet location. That is a great example of what I'm talking about with 300 being the bedrock. You wouldn't have been able to answer that question just with the article that it specifically deals with, and that's 310.10 B and C. You have to have that other component of Article 300. And so, guys, you really have to pay close attention to these test questions to make sure that you're taking into account any article that applies. In this case, Article 300 is very misleading because it really does have a whole lot of real core uh, test questions. Uh, specifically on a German's test uh, recently, there was a question that had to do with a filled threaded ferrous metal, or uh, it was a, I don't even know if they use the word ferrous metal in the test, but it was basically a rigid conduit that had been filled threaded, right? And they were asking you what type of material or what kind of compound would you have to treat the threads with? And so the majority of people would go to, uh, uh, what's the article that has a, a, a RMC, is it 3, 334? That's one I don't remember off the top of my head. 344. 344. So most of the guys would go back to 3, uh, yeah, 334 is Romax, I don't know what I was thinking. 344, and you know, even though it's not a real long article, it does, by the time you go uh, look it up, find the page number, you're here, it's still going to take you a couple of uh, minutes at least to kind of scan through it. Well, you're not going to find the answer to that test question in rigid conduit. It's not going to be in Article 344. 
Okay? And the reason for it is, is that really any ferrous type of raceway, any kind of ferrous metal, in other words, a metal that's uh, prone to oxidization, right, or rust, if you look back in chapter 300, or article 300, I keep calling it a chapter, it's chapter 3, article 300, and go back to, uh, see, page, uh, 139 and, and 140. Very bottom down there, it's a general rule that applies across the board, no matter what specific raceway it is, as long as it's ferrous metal and you field thread or field cut it, you should apply a coating with an approved corrosion resistant material and furthermore, on the next page, that should be, uh, have an electrically conductive corrosion con resistant compound. That's actually the answer to the test question. Okay? On the master's test, there's a bunch of examples like that we could go through for 10, 15 minutes talking about all the stuff that Article 300 really has that you just have to know almost by heart. So Article 300 is going to be one of those you're going to put on your list that's an absolute must read. It's one of the top 10 in the code book. All right. And then, of course, uh, Chapter 4. Uh, we have quite a few in 410, but the, ma the majority of that's just because it's a really long article. Uh, article 430, uh, 25 questions. That's probably closer to about 35 now with a lot of the newer changes that have gone through. Uh, and then 440, which is your HVAC, 445 uh, generators, transformers, and then the back part with some specific equipment. But for sure, for certain, Article 430, uh, 410 are both going to be two that uh, you really want to focus on. And then Chapter 5 is one of those oddball chapters. Chapter 5 is a really big chapter. And you got a lot of questions just kind of sprinkled throughout it. Uh, chapter 5 is actually fairly an easy one to fairly uh, navigate through, so it shouldn't be uh, too hard of a chapter for us to kind of get you up to speed on. All right, so that is a rough breakdown. Chapter 6 uh, is got fewer questions in it than Chapter 5 does. I'd say probably in the 60 area. Uh, chapter 7's got about 15, and Chapter 8's got about 6 or 8. Uh, chapter 9 is important with all of our tables, but it's not necessarily a directly related one. So if you were just talking about direct code questions, maybe 4 or 5 out of chapter 9. So that's, your, that's a brief uh, kind of a run through what you're going to see on the uh, test as far as your articles and chapters are concerned. Now, let's talk about the actual layout of your code book. And uh, see, it's working just fine. Now... shame too because the next one is actually a picture of me when I used to have hair. Not a very good electrician. Before I went to my own class. Man, I'll tell you what. I've got the uh, the tech room ones today. There we go. Alright, so uh, just briefly let's talk about your code book layout. Uh, for the journeyman, really your code book layout is a really critical uh, part of being able to pass this test. You really do need to know how the structure is so that you can mentally look at a test question and go, okay, I kind of know where that would be. Even if you don't uh, want to look it up in the index or can't find it in the index, you still have to have a way to kind of reason out where would it fall in the code book, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, table contents is the first part, and we'll, we'll come back and talk about that in a minute. Uh, you guys already know there's nine chapters because we just talked about it. All of the articles are individual subjects, uh, 90 through 830. Uh, parts, of course, are divisions of an article. Sections and tables are code requirements. This next line item right here is absolutely one of the first major tips I've got to tell you about, and that is exceptions. Okay. Um, if you look back on that handout that I gave you, they come straight from PSI that looks like this right here. They tell you it's on page five. That little paragraph right down here in the corner, uh, just look at it real quick. Examination reference material list, okay? That first paragraph, the last sentence, what does it say? It says, when responding to the test questions, do not consider code exceptions unless the test question specifically directs you to consider them. Guys, that is so important, you have no idea. It's one of the 800-pound gorillas of the dirty secrets that they use to trick you, okay? Perfect example. Everybody in here has done overhead service, right? I'm, I'm, I'm almost everybody. I don't know too many of them, uh, people who go through a class like this that haven't done one at least once in their lifetime or their uh, career. 
What is your normal average height above a rooftop for your weatherhead? Do it a roof penetration, a red service, right? Residential construction or whatever. Three feet, three feet right? Three feet so, is maximum, right? Well, if you had a test question and ask you what that distance is or the minimum distance is, what would you answer if your answers were three, six, eight, and ten? <coughs> three feet. Because that's we do it all the time. I, I don't know how I've, I have done two in my lifetime that weren't that three feet, but all the rest of them have always been three feet. In fact, the uh, code, uh, code criteria from the uh, Austin Energy there in Austin, they even have a little picture, and it's set at 36 inches, right, to the bottom of the weatherhead, or actually, the, yeah, the bottom of the weatherhead. So, how would you guys feel about the fact that I told you that the answer is actually eight? I almost answered the question there. All right. So. Well, first of all, where would I find the answer to that test question? I'm going to ask you, what is the minimum required height above a rooftop for an overhead service, a set of overhead well, service conditions? Huh? Well, minimum, like, did, did, did you say five minimum, the, the minimum is eight feet. Eight feet. Eight feet. Follow, follow along with me here. Okay. Let's look it up. Where would I find the answer to a question that had to do with a minimum clearance for overhead service conductors? Article 230, right? We said uh, earlier that 230 was uh, service uh, services. So let's look at Article 230 real quick. We're looking for the section that deals with uh, clearances over a rooftop. Yep, it's kind of toward the front there. But if you go back a little further to 230.24 on page 80, we get into an article that specifically is listed as clearances, overhead service conductors above roofs. That's under note A. I'm on the left-hand column, kind of toward the top. What does it say right there in the first paragraph? Not less than 2.5 meters. Not less than 8 feet, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, if you go a little further down into the exceptions, under exception number 3 right there, excuse me, 2, it tells you that if your roof slope is 4 and 12 or greater. It's the rise and run, the pitch of the roof, right? Mm -hmm. Almost every roof out there that I've ever run across is going to be greater than 4 and 12. 4 and 12 is actually a pretty gentle slope, okay? So the bottom line is, is that 90% of the things that we build are under that exception. But because of exactly what PSI instructed you to do, you have got to be real careful about using your trade knowledge are your trade uh, experiences or gut reaction to answer these test questions? There's quite a few exceptions just like that that we consider the rule because it's almost what we, we run across all the time. But for the test, it's not the right answer, okay? So my point is, is that tip number one, make sure you're looking the articles up and make sure you're looking at both the article itself and any exceptions that are below it and then go back to the test question and see whether it allows you or tells you anything about exceptions. If it doesn't, you got to ignore them. And there's, there's motors, especially for you masters, man, they'll twist you around until uh, till Tuesday with uh, exceptions or not using exceptions. And for the journeyman too, you guys will get plenty of motors tomorrow. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about as we go through them. All right, so that's really important. Of course, fine print notes, which is explanatory material. Uh, for the 2011, they've changed that to uh, informational notes. So they just changed the heading, but it's still the exact same thing. And that's just going to be stuff, a lot of times it's a reference to uh, some other uh, uh, codes uh, book or some other type of manufacturing book or catalog. If you look in uh, arc faults, the one good example I can give you of that is uh, 210. What? Anybody know the arc faults off the top of your head? 210.12. There's, there's two articles. In uh, 210, that I guarantee you, as a journeyman electrician and as a master electrician, you're going to have both of them on your test. The first being 210.8, and the second one's 210.12. Guarantee it. I, I will give you your money back and, and my firstborn and, and maybe even a liter of my blood if you don't have 210.8 and 210.12 uh, on your test. So the first one, of course, being GFCI protection, and then 210.12. If you look at the bottom of 210.12, I think it's one of the very first. Uh, Paragraphs, they have a little informational note number one right below it, and it tells you that the UL listing that uh, covers arc fault combination and series devices is what? 1699-1999. And that, that's a test question on a journeyman's exam. Been off and on for about uh, eight months. It's been one that they've kept on, but that's a good example of 
you know, make sure you're looking at exceptions, especially if they're asking you for another uh, code reference or another addition reference to a different catalog or some other manufacturer data. That'd be your dead clue that you should be looking for a, a fine print note. All right. Now, the uh, code book layout, which is the next slide there, is uh, changes from the 2008 are in gray highlighted areas. Now, that is the same type of layout that we had in the 2008 edition. It was the first time, the 2008 was the first edition that had this uh, breakdown as far as, it used to, it was all underlined, right? Of course, the underline was real kind of hard to read, and uh, especially when you had some pretty dense areas. So anywhere in your code book that you see a gray out, grayed out area, that is a change from the previous edition. Now, earlier this morning, we were talking about that, and I said that the majority of the changes really are kind of a, uh, a, a structure layout more than they are anything else. So a lot of the stuff that you see grayed out in the 2008 edition might have been all you know, lumped together, or maybe they were in different sections, so they lumped them together for this one, or they built them out into lists so they're a little easier to read, a little easier to navigate. And then uh, if you see a black not dot next to it, that's a paragraph that was deleted. There's not that many test questions that uh, uh, you, you couldn't answer with the 2008 edition, and you still can take an 08 into the uh, test center, but I wouldn't uh, suggest it. But there's just not that much that was deleted that's really that important. Lines beside the table denote changes, and that can be important. And then the next line item there, note E, is really important. Equipment that's rated under 600 volts comes in the front of the article, okay? So any article that we're dealing with, let's, let's take services, for example. We are just talking about Article 230 a minute ago, right? I have a service rated at, let's say, uh, uh, rated 1,000 volts, okay? And I want to know <coughs> an answer about a disconnecting means. I would find that in the back part of Article 230 and not in the front part. And you really do have to pay real close attention to the voltage rating of the question because you can have the exact same question one of them at 480 volts and one of them at 1,000 volts, and the answers are night and day different, okay? Uh, junction pull boxes are a good example. What is a uh, standard size multiplier? What's the minimum multiplier you use for a straight pull box? Side, we're sizing uh, pull boxes, right? Y'all yep, have done that at uh, somewhere at one point till I've heard that, right? So with a, with a straight pull, we have a multiplier we, we use against the largest raceways in a row, right? Huh? Eight times, yeah. right? So where would we find that, just out of curiosity? Yeah, it is in 300. It's 314. 314. Uh, what is it? 24, 28. 314.28. Page 183. It says right there. So. The test question says you've got uh, uh, XXX size uh, conductors coming into a, a, a straight pull box, and the largest trade size is two inches. Uh, the sum of all the other ones are also two inches. You've got four sets, uh, rated over 1,000 volts. What is the multiplier used to calculate the length of that pull box? And your test question offers you four inches, six inches, or excuse me, uh, six times, eight times, 32 times, 48 times. What would your answer be? Straight pull, yeah. But what I said was it was a thousand volt rated. Everything that we're looking at here is 600 volts or less, right? If you flip one more page over and look under 314. Uh, actually, look at the section there, section uh, six, or uh, excuse me, four. Right next to that says pull box and junction boxes for use on systems over 600 volts, right? And then on straight pulls under 314.71a, what do you have? It goes from 8 to 48 times, doesn't it? Okay? So my whole point with that is, is just make sure that, you know, in an article there's a lot of examples of that where, you know, you have your 600 volts or less in the front part of the article and in the back we go into the higher voltage rating stuff. And it really can be a really critical distinction on a... Uh, test question on which type or what your voltage rating is, so pay attention to it, okay? And then key notes of explanation are now informational notes, and I think I already said that, so. <coughs> and that's really not that important of an item anyway. All right, now in your code book, we just looked at uh, a section labeled uh, number four, right? See like Roman number four there? 
Uh, one thing I want you guys to do, and this is the this is this is tip number one. It's actually tip number two, but it's the first tip that I'm going to give you that will make you a lot faster navigate through this code book. Okay? So let's we're in Article 230, so let's just stick there. So let's say that you have a question that has to do with. Um, let me think of a good example here. Question that has to do with uh, disconnected means and service equipment. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you look at the very front page, Article Two Thirty on page seventy-eight, you'll see a little ladder diagram, and right above that, you see some sections or some uh, line items across the top. And I've got a slide up here that basically shows you the same thing. So, I have a question that has to do with service equipment and disconnected means for it, right? Well, if you look at the top of that, right across there, you see immediately that's going to be in part six. That's section six, part six, whatever you want to call it. Now, quickly, just flip through Article 230 and just try to see if you can find section six real easily in all of the noise that's in this book. It's pretty tough. I mean, go ahead and try. I mean, it's kind of a little bit of an exercise. It, it, yep, it is on page 84. But it can be kind of hard to see. It's hard to distinguish those things. Now, what I tell guys to do, and this is why I tell you on the phone or, or we tell you in the email or I've told you earlier, you want to take a different color highlighter than you've used. So, you, like, you've got blue on most of your stuff there. You want to take a yellow or a pink or, or whatever color, you know, makes you feel good about, you know, who you really are. <laughs> yeah, I see that got a laugh. All right. Not completely dead. Uh, and you want to highlight those sections in a different color, okay? You want to make them stand out because it's a tool. It really is. That right there is a road map of one of the biggest articles in the book. It shows you where everything you have. I mean, if you have a test question that had to do with the exact one we just did, which was a service that was rated over 1,000 volts, and we're talking about a juncture, well, excuse me, a bad example. It's in a different uh, article. Uh, service equipment over current protection, or if you had a question about uh, your entrance conductor, whether it be overhead or under, underground. And then the ladder diagram is a good, uh, you know, visual connotation. The same thing. Again, you have the same parts on uh, either this side. We've got a couple of them, or one of them over there as well. So if you have a test question that has anything to do with services, and if you go back and look at the uh, breakdown here, Article 230 has 18 questions, so it's not a huge uh, number, but you'll probably have three or four on your test, right? So knowing how to kind of navigate through that, and going back and uh, uh, having those parts highlighted, it'll make you flip through them a lot faster. Now, there's a few articles just like that that I would add to it, and I've got them listed down on the bottom. 230, 250, 410, and 430. Be sure you write those down, and that's one of the things that you're going to have to do on your homework, and that is go through your book and highlight those sections. So just write those down real quick. Anybody have any idea what the largest article in the entire code book is? Roundage? You'd think so. It's actually the second largest. But it's definitely on the list down there. 250, right? From uh, as far as just sheer page numbers, what we're talking about. The largest one in the entire book is. I'll give you a hint, it's one of those on that list. It's not 230, it's not 250, it's 430, it's motors. Motors has the largest number of pages. Uh, 410 follows pretty close. Uh, 250 is actually the second largest. And uh, so just the bulk number of pages that you have to navigate through those sections are just, they're just enormous. So if you're using that method to kind of help you navigate through it, really will kind of help a, a lot. All right. <clears throat> now, the uh, other thing that I need to talk to you about is... Uh, probably the largest single individual mistake I see from uh, most guys taking the test. And I'll tell you, the, uh, uh, probably more so with the journeyman than it is even the masters. And that is, you know, it's an open book test, right? I mean, how hard can an open book test be when you got an index in the back that tells you where everything is? I mean, it, it's right here in the back. Look, you've got an index A through Z. It's got all these keywords. I mean, hell, you wouldn't even have to buy a... Uh, what is that guy, that's <coughs> Florida Tom Henry? 
You don't have to buy his keyword search index because there's a free one right here, right? And so guys go in there thinking, it's an open book test. I got a keyword index. I'm a Well, guess what? If it was that easy, a three-year-old could do it, right? Well, then why don't we have a pass rate of, you know, 16% at best? Well, the index is a trap. I'm telling you right now. And I promise you, the average guy goes in there, and that's the first place they go to to try to answer test questions. And where I stand, it's the last place I go. That's the very last thing in that book that I'll use to find a test. Now, I'm not telling you that you necessarily have to be that extreme uh, with it, okay? Because I've got a few uh, years worth of nothing but code uh, experience that uh, some of you may not have. But that index has got a lot of problems with it. The first thing is, is that the layout of it is not the same way that, that a normal person would, would think of as far as uh, how to list stuff, right? It's almost like an attorney wrote this crap. Uh, any of you guys have any military experience? Anybody? No? Uh, I started my career back in uh, 1987 in the Army. That's why I'm bald, really, the truth is. A little of that uh, uh, stuff they were spraying around and... Of course, they used to give us stuff in our drinks called saltpeter. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think they did that for the people in the Navy, too. Did they? Well, yeah, but the Navy people, are, they do far worse to them because everyone I've ever met is kind of an odd. Curry. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, if, if you were to try to order a shirt, let's you know, say you, you needed a new uh, a battle dress uniform or something, you need to go to a quartermaster and order one, right? So we're talking about a, just let's just say a white shirt, just like what I'm wearing here, okay? And he'd tell you to go to look it up in the mill spec catalog and then bring him back the uh, mill part number and, and he'd order it. Well, you go back to the catalog and you look under S for shirts, it ain't there. And it's the same way this index is. Uh, the way the military looks at it is this is really a garment, first of all. Second of all, it's a male garment. Third of all, it's the color. And then next, it's the size. And then next, it's the purpose of it, whether it's battle dress or classic. I mean, it's just really kind of backwards. It's indexed the same way. If you're looking for the definition of uh, nominal voltage, right? Everybody know what nominal voltage is? Anybody? Anybody want to take a stab at it? It's classification, right? Mm -hmm. that, that receptacle over there is classified at 120 volts. How many times have you put a, me a meter on a general purpose receptacle like that and gotten actually exactly 120 volts? Once or twice, maybe out of 100, right? Mm -hmm. So we just classify it as a 120 volt so that we know that that is, because otherwise we'd just call it 123 or 124 or 118. I mean, so it's a classification of 120. But a test question that asks you the definition of nominal voltage, use your index real fast and, and try to find it. Just a little practice here. We're looking for nominal voltage, right? <coughs> I was one step behind last time. One step behind, and now you're one, one step, step ahead. ahead. That was the whole so thing. So we're just practicing. So obviously the average person will look under N for nominal voltage, right? Because that's the definition that we're trying to find. And, of course, it's not under N, is it? It's right. under voltages and then common nominal. So you actually kind of have to think backwards. And you'd be in the B section, not in the N section anyway. And there's a whole bunch of sec uh, uh, items just like that that are just kind of crazy. Let's look at conductors real quick. Here's another thing about this uh, uh, layout. Here I have a question that has to do with a specific type of wire. First of all, you'd have to remember that it's not called a wire, it's called a conductor. And then once you found conductors, I mean, my God, look at it. It's almost two, three pages, almost two pages long just by itself, right? So you kind of have to go to the root of it, the way they classify it, the correct terminology, and then kind of have to navigate through the, the tree, so to speak, and it's a mess. It's kind of tough. Now that you've found voltage is common nominal, what's the other thing about that index? The other huge issue about the index that is absolutely missing. What are you missing out of the index? Don't you say a word. I swear <laughs> I'll kick you out of class. It's in my head, though. I know it. I know the what, is it? what is it about that index that you're missing? Page number. Page number. Man, I'm telling you what. It, you try to find something with an article number, it takes forever. It really does. It, it's just, it doesn't make much sense. This thing's just like a dictionary. If you look at the top of any page, at the top left-hand side, you have the very first article that occurs on that page, and the other side, you have the very last article on that page, and so it's tough. If you're looking for, uh, I don't want to use that one because that one's kind of easy because it's in uh, uh, Article 100. Let's say you're looking for a question that had to do with a, a feeder and a busway, and it tells you it's Article 368.17. 
So find 368.17. So it's not impossible. Of course, you can do it, but you know you're going through 368. Let's see, uh, three. I'm just looking at the top up here. 368. Uh, damn it, I passed it. 368.17. There's 12. There it is. It's on uh, page 225. Well, if I'd have told you 225, you'd already been there by now, yeah. right? Yeah. Not that big of a difference on any individual question, but it can be if you're using that index for 50 questions, right? If it's a minute worth of difference, there's a whole hour almost worth of difference. I'm telling you what, if you're using that index as your sole piece of, of uh, weapon or your, your best tool in your arsenal, Man, you're already starting out with a uh, with a handicap. Okay, it's tough. The other thing about that index is they know what's in that index better than you do. Trust me, I promise you. I, I take that to the bank. Okay, so if I'm writing a test question and I'm trying to make you fail, or at least make sure that that you really are good at what you do, I'm not going to make it easy, and I'm certainly not going to make the keywords that easy to find in the index if I know what they are. That's exactly what happens. <coughs> it takes several repetitions of a word to even make it back there in the back anyway. Okay? And then they'll sometimes, they won't even use the exact same word necessarily. So uh, a good example of that is a uh, uh, question. This is on a master's test. And I, I swear to God, guys, this gave, this gave me uh, almost a week of, of uh, uh, heartburn trying to find the darn thing because we couldn't understand what exactly it was, and now watch me, I won't even be able to find it again, even though I know where it is. Uh, trying to find it because of the way it was written, and what it has to do with, it's actually on page two, almost there. Uh, it's on page 237. Let's look at this real quick. So it's a, question, a test question that has to do with... Uh, a combination raceway, but they don't even call it that. So they basically say, if you have a, a, a raceway, okay, a metallic raceway, I'm on page 237, uh, 386.70. Everybody there? Mm -hmm. So what the test question says is where you have a raceway that has both control wiring and high, uh, let's see, it was uh, high impedance discharge lighting circuits. That raceway shall be identified by blank, blank, and then I think the, word, the one they actually used was uh, stamping, I think was the actual keyword. Now, how in the heck would you find that in the index if you're looking for control circuits, control wiring, or high impedance or high intensity, or excuse me, high impedance discharge lighting? Well, neither one of them, first of all, are even in the in index, and even if they were, it wouldn't lead you back to this point because they don't even use the same word, right? So you really would have to, now that's an extreme example, all right? There, there's some that, uh, even, like I said, even I had a hard time with that one. But there are a lot of questions like that where you kind of have to instinctively understand what that keyword really is to be able to then be able to locate it in the code book. So the keywords aren't, uh, aren't the easiest way to do it, and that index has is, is got a lot of problems to it. Now, uh, let's try one real quick. Let's just use the index and nothing else. A test question that had to do with adjustable speed drive system shall have conductors calculated using blank percentage. This is a real test question. Just came out uh, not that long ago. It's been on just about everybody's test that uh, I'm aware of. Adjustable speed drive system shall have conductors calculated using blank percentage. So we're just using the index. Okay. So you're back here in the back. We're looking for what? Conductors. What he says. He's not sure. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I have a bad habit of being right in the way of the life there. Okay, so.
I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I hate this index. I don't know what to do. It, uh, it's even hard to read. Anybody find it yet? Another gray hair. Come on, guys. Lighten up. It's going to be a long two days. All right. So, uh, uh, drive, no. Uh, S for speed. Well, let me give you a hint. It's in motors. Uh, it's usually we're talking about an adjustable speed drive system. We're talking about controlling the speed of a motor, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look under motors under uh, the index, that at least give you a little bit of a, a help. So let's see. Look under motors. Uh, motors. Yeah, there it is right there. It says adjustable speed drive system. Found it, right? All right. So, uh, of course, it's missing the page number, but that's all right. It tells you right there, 430.88, right? And then it says something about 430 uh, minus X or I don't know, something like that. Yeah, minus X. Just doing some algebra back there too. So, all right, so we found it, right? Now let's go find it in the, code, the article, the actual article it's uh, talking about. We're looking for the percentage of conductors uh, that we use to size them. Page 328. That's a page number for 430.88. gets a free cup of coffee.